On the morning of the 26th, Gloucester Island was close aboard, and the spray anchored in the evening at Port Denison, where rests on a hill the sweet little town of Bowen, the future watering place and health resort of Queensland. The country all about here had a healthful appearance. The harbour was easy of approach, spacious and safe, and afforded excellent holding ground. It was quiet in Bowen when the spray arrived, and the good people, with an hour to throw away on the second evening of her arrival, came down to the School of Arts to talk about the voyage, it being the latest event. It was duly advertised in the two little papers, Boomerang and Nully Nully, in the one the day before the affair came off, and in the other the day after, which was all the same to the editor, and for that matter it was the same to me. Besides this, circulars were distributed with a flourish, and the best bellman in Australia was employed. But I could have keel-hauled the wretch, bell and all, when he came to the door of the little hotel, where my prospective audience and I were dining, and with his clattering bell and fiendish yell, made noises that would awake the dead, all over the voyage of the spray, from Boston to Bowen, the two hubs in the cartwheels of creation, as the boomerang afterwards said. Mr. Miles, magistrate, harbour master, land commissioner, gold warden, etc., was chairman, and introduced me, for what reason I never knew, except to embarrass me with a sense of vain ostentation and embitter my life. For heaven knows, I had met every person in town the first hour ashore. I knew them all by name now, and they all knew me. However, Mr. Miles was a good talker. Indeed, I tried to induce him to go on and tell the story while I showed the pictures, but this he refused to do. I may explain that it was a talk illustrated by Stereopticon. The views were good, but the lantern, a thirty-shilling affair, was wretched and had only an oil lamp in it. I sailed early the next morning before the papers came out, thinking it best to do so. They each appeared with a favourable column, however, of what they called a lecture, so I learned afterward, and they had a kind word for the bellman besides. From Port Denison, the sloop ran before the constant trade wind, and made no stop at all, night or day, till she reached Cooktown, on the Endeavour River, where she arrived Monday, May 31, 1897, before a furious blast of wind encountered that day fifty miles down the coast. On this parallel of latitude is the high ridge and backbone of the trade winds, which about Cooktown amount often to a hard gale. I had been charged to navigate the route with extra care, and to feel my way over the ground. The skilled officer of the Royal Navy, who advised me to take the Barrier Reef Passage, wrote me that HMS Orlando steamed nights as well as days through it, but that I, under sail, would jeopardise my vessel on coral reefs if I undertook to do so. Confidentially, it would have been no easy matter finding anchorage every night. The hard work, too, of getting the sloop under way every morning was finished, I had hoped, when she cleared the Strait of Magellan. Besides that, the best of Admiralty charts made it possible to keep on sailing night and day. Indeed, with a fair wind, and in the clear weather of that season, the way through the Barrier Reef Channel, in all sincerity, was clearer than a highway in a busy city and by all odds less dangerous. But to anyone contemplating the voyage, I would say beware of reefs day or night, or, remaining on the land, be wary still.
The spray came flying into port like a bird, said the Longshore Daily Papers of Cooktown the morning after she arrived. And it seemed strange, they added, that only one man could be seen on board working the craft. The spray was doing her best, to be sure, for it was near night and she was in haste to find a perch before dark. Tacking inside of all the craft in port, I moored her at sunset nearly abreast the Captain Cook monument, and next morning went ashore to feast my eyes on the very stones the great navigator had seen, for I was now on a seaman's consecrated ground. But there seemed a question in Cooktown's mind, as to the exact spot where his ship, the Endeavour, hove down for repairs on her memorable voyage around the world. Some said it was not at all at the place where the monument now stood. A discussion of the subject was going on one morning where I happened to be, and a young lady present, turning to me as one of some authority in nautical matters, very flatteringly asked my opinion. Well, I could see no reason why Captain Cook, if he made up his mind to repair his ship inland, couldn't have dredged out a channel to the place where the monument now stood, if he had a dredging machine with him, and afterwards fill it up again. For Captain Cook could do most anything, and nobody ever said that he hadn't a dredger along. The young lady seemed to lean to my way of thinking, and following up the story of the historical voyage, asked if I had visited the point farther down the harbour where the great circumnavigator was murdered. This took my breath, but a bright schoolboy coming along relieved my embarrassment, for, like all boys seeing that information was wanted, he volunteered to supply it. Said he, Captain Cook wasn't murdered here at all, ma'am. He was killed in Africa, a lion at him. Here I was reminded of distressful days gone by. I think it was in 1866 that the old steamship Suchet, from Batavia for Sydney, put in at Cooktown for scurvy grass, as I always thought, and incidentally to land males. On her sick list was my fevered self, and so I didn't see the place till I came back on the spray thirty-one years later. And now I saw coming into port the physical wrecks of miners from New Guinea, destitute and dying. Many had died on the way and had been buried at sea. He would have been a hardened wretch who could look on and not try to do something for them. The sympathy of all went out to these sufferers, but the little town was already straightened from a long run on its benevolence. I thought of the matter of the lady's gift to me at Tasmania, which I had promised myself I would keep only as a loan, but found now to my embarrassment that I had invested the money. However, the good Cooktown people wished to hear a story of the sea, and how the crew of the spray fared when illness got aboard of her. Accordingly, the little Presbyterian church on the hill was opened for a conversation. Everybody talked, and they made a roaring success of it. Judge Chester, the magistrate, was at the head of the gam, and so it was bound to succeed. He it was who annexed the island of New Guinea to Great Britain. While I was about it, said he, I annexed a blooming lot of it. There was a ring in the statement pleasant to the ear of an old voyager. However, the Germans made such a row over the judge's mainsail hall that they got a share in the venture. 